thanks very much for joining this presentation. I'm very honored and delighted to be here. My big thanks go to the organizers of the American Geographical Society Geography 2050 Conference in 2021, and especially to Dr. D. Jordan, who invited me for this spotlight session. I'm excited to bring to you today a summary, brief summary of my long experience as an educator, teaching, doing research, and other professional experiences as a geographer. In this presentation that I have titled Countering Barriers, Practices in Geography for a More Equitable Future. My name is Ibikwo Johnston Anumomo, and I'm a professor in the Department of Geography at SUNY Cotland. My position in this presentation is to spotlight what we as geography educators and scholars can do when it comes to concerns of social justice, equity, inclusivity, diversity, and intersectionality, because we have both the opportunity and the challenge to address topics of racism, sexism, through anti-racist and feminist perspectives, challenging power relations, be they corporate or patriarchal, using examples across the globe, and I will focus primarily on African examples as well as US examples. The point is to highlight non-ethnocentric approaches. I schooled in Nigeria, but I have spent a lot of time in the United States. And my goal is that we can continue to counter these kinds of stereotypes that misrepresent either the United States or other parts of the world. We are at an opportune time to use many classic, true, well-tested content, whether they are for advanced scholars or even for beginning scholars, helping to dispel many of the myths and hopefully using a global perspective to broaden our lenses to ensure a more equitable future. I start with what I think is one of the most robust approaches, feminist and anti-racist um, perspectives for the topic of inequity by looking at what seemingly seems like a straightforward um, chart giving us numbers depicting the relatively high levels, sizable, whether it's one quarter or 50% of female labor in agriculture across African countries. But what these data hide rather than show is that in spite of the very significant work that women do, what counts is not often what matters. In other words, invalidating, making the work of women invisible when it comes to data that shows the gallons of pipe water that's in a village, for instance, or the number of cattle that a man has, but does not have any information about the number of buckets that a woman carries on her head, how many miles she walks, or the time she spends milking the cow for the household. In the mindset of not excluding half the human, being more inclusive, it shows the need for more participatory methods and alternative analysis in geography. There are also in our interdisciplinary subject geography, a variety of ways by which we can debunk misrepresentations through nuanced perspectives. In that example on agriculture, for instance, we could look at what is paid labor versus unpaid, who has labor saving devices rather than which groups of people or which subpopulations do not cast in an umbrella of resources, whether it's land, labor, capital, or time, 
Most audiences, scholarly or otherwise, can readily relate to these kinds of analyses. Comparative analyses are very good. So whether it's choices among the classics that compare people of color, male versus female, or even people based on appearances and bodily image, we could extend these kinds of analyses into cross-cultural ones over in the United States, over in another country, South Africa, then and now, not just the land alienation in countries abroad, but what exists in our own communities, like um, the alienation of land from native and indigenous peoples. This is a title that I think is very relevant for today's theme, a place at the table. It's a call for equity. It's a video that I think is very good in terms of its representativeness, whether it's the experiences of Jewish Americans, Irish Americans, new immigrants into the United States, African Americans, LGBTQ population, and so on. Additional materials such as Jane Elliott's um, well, recognized um, content or even changing perspectives about body image and a social construction of differences that often means we have to tackle issues of structural violence towards particular identities and bodies. Take a look at this for a minute. No, I don't have a minute. But this is a cornerstone. And what we are seeing are the burglary proof, the times of opening in a classic inner city neighborhood. Contrast the things that are sold with the outside shops, I mean, outskirt shops, big box department stores like Walmart, on the intersections far away from the inner city and try and consider how much you would pay for daily items in a Walmart store compared to the local inner city neighborhood. And you see the economic divide and the inequitable prices for commodities. Here's a magazine, those of us who know about the American Geographical Society will realize that we can, using images, simple things, just in 930 words, the divide that is very prevalent in American societies. Maps that depict the racial dot map are available online. And they debunk the tendency to think that residential segregation only exists in the deep south. In actual fact, whether it's Milwaukee or upstate New York, as shown in this image of Buffalo. In explaining why there is such divide and persistent residential segregation, we could look at a variety of reasons the point being to avoid simplistic explanations and complicate the continuing practices and policies, whether it's redlining, which continues to have long time effects of inequities, or whether it is linguistic profiling that contradicts the hope and the policies for fair housing. Things remain unfair in access to housing from Milwaukee to Buffalo to Baltimore. So we have to continue this difficult dialogue still because whether it's anti-Asian or anti-Black racism, everyday racism is still pervasive 
And although they are unsavory topics, they need to be discussed rather than silenced. Yes, there are changing trends. There's some progress, but headlines, headline news still show the inequitable realities of our world. Oftentimes, empirical studies are very rich in presenting the information and ways to tackle the continuing inequalities. I showcase some research that I have done in my work, looking at travel inequalities. In this first chart, what it is depicting is not just gender, but the combination of gender and race in the disproportionate tendency for immigrants, foreign born, black women especially, to be more dependent on public transportation. This is data for Miami. In the next chart, another dimension of inequality is the number of minutes travel time that black workers spend when they have to go to locations, workplaces in the suburbs compared to white counterparts. Mind you, this is comparing apples to apples. Everybody has a car. And yet, when it's a suburban destination, there is clearly a special mismatch even among women, intersectionality and inequities. And pardon me for this typology, but consider convenient versus constrained commutes. Focus on the purple ones, not so happy. I have incorporated income into the travel time of different subgroups of the population in this data. And as you can see, it's black women who are more constrained and experience long commutes to low wage jobs. Suffice it to say that this shows us the gender wage gap at work and how some people in spite of the effort and not compensated adequately. These kind of data have very strong implications about the restricted women um, movement for black women, especially cross-culturally, whether it's the United States or in South Africa, but it also draws attention to the activism and the resistance in addition to the accomplishments of subaltern peoples across time and across space. In a goal towards more equitable access, we must incorporate other sociodemographic factors, whether it's age or parental status. And I'm pleased to say that young scholars who are doing good work empirical work are increasingly incorporating other elements of identity, including access to employment or lack of access to employment for people with disabilities. There's a recent study by a young scholar in Michigan who studied this for New York. In the other work that I have done, collaborative work across other locations, I focused on livelihood research. And a particular one that I want to highlight, I jokingly call the toilet paper, shows the transition from stereotypical images such as this to much more clean sanitation facilities. In this study of the privatization of public toilets in Nairobi, Kenya, the question we asked, along with my co-authors, is about equitable sanitation. Who benefits, males, females, across socioeconomic groups? 
The results of the survey suggest at, at first that many people do and that women disproportionately benefit on the dimensions of better privacy, increased security, and the specific needs, things that definitely we would consider meeting equitable futures. However, there is one particular dimension of inadequacy or in, inequitable reality. And it's what we as geographers will consider the accessibility, proximity, or the availability. As you might have noticed, women are staying longer to use the echo toilets while men have urinals and just go in and out more likely to spend under five minutes. Another dimension is the economic burden. The continuing tendency for more women to live in poverty means that even in attempts to provide services by privatizing those services, low income women are disproportionately affected. I want to cast this into contemporary importance of sanitation and water. Consider some recent data that shows that in country after country, it's women who spend more time collecting water. Bring this to, 19, to the year 2020 or 2021 in a global pandemic and the implications are very clear, both for the employment opportunities for women or even education because access to good toilets makes young girls stay at school more so. Than, to, um, than the attrition that could result. I'm coming towards the end, but I just want to say ways by which we can move towards equity or equitable futures is to amplify the creativity and innovations that people are doing across the board, whether it's BIPOC populations, whether it's people internationally, young people as illustrated in these examples. It has an appeal and it also gets to the topics of social justice. And my take home message would be that as geographers, we do have a discipline which allows us to focus a lot on civic responsibility and to use informed and engaged practices and approaches towards inclusivity and equity. We must take advantage of this unique perspective. Whether it's in our classrooms or outside the classroom, in the ways we engage with one another or how we can broaden participation to be inclusive in geography for geographers and others who use geographical approaches and techniques. We do have the strength as a discipline to handle controversial issues or urgent needs for equity. Since this is our subject and it's a discipline that always looks to context as a prequel to interpretation and to the global perspective as an antidote to local myopia. My final slides just highlight some things which I think are very important in broadening participation. They show you some of the work that I have done recently through international collaboration, whether it's in the area of teaching research, the opportunities of the uh, modern shall we say internet as I am presenting now, to collaborate with folks at the University of Lagos, the hands-on things to work with the community in our role as public intellectuals, promoting work and practices towards social justice across generation, across activities, interdisciplinary, such that the work we do, and I'm especially conscien I'm conscious of this, 
because as somebody who grew up outside of the United States, who is a black female geographer, people like me are a super minority. We find ourselves doing a lot of service work and experiential work and transformational work, reaching out to colleagues, recommendations, going to presentations, co-mentoring, learning from others through practices that help us forge alliances within and outside our locations and our disciplines in ways that I think promote the emphasis that people of color, BIPOC communities, or people in less developed countries should not be seen as victims, but also as partners, collaborators, indeed courageous agents of change from environmental in initiatives to educational and political leadership roles. It's just a chance to say thank you very much and to end on a positive note that when it comes to topics of equity, equality, diversity, inclusion and social justice, geographers can and are indeed um, well poised to move towards a more equitable future. Thank you very much. <laughs>